Hello, continuing with this case on beautiful veneers and crowns on upper teeth, I'm placing veneers on cuspid through cuspid and full crowns on the first or second bicuspid. One of the bicuspids was extracted for orthodontic reasons years ago, both right and left. So full crowns on the single bicuspid and the uh, first molar. So this is on seating the veneers and crowns. In the first part, I talked about in, uh, prepping the teeth, the wax up, the impression, and the provisional restorations. This is before and after. I'm amazed when I see these patients post-operative after we've restored their teeth. This was a nice woman. You know, her teeth weren't horrible, but she'd worn them off and didn't like the color and had a bunch of big fillings in the, in the back teeth, posterior teeth. So this is going to be on uh, the dental minute right now, but when we restore the mandibular teeth in a month or so, it'll be in the library of dentistrymasterclasses.com under the comprehensive cases. So this woman's whole demeanor changed. To me, she looks like a teenager after we get through. This is before and after veneers on the anterior teeth. So I'm going to be, these are provisional restorations which we talked about in the last part. So I'm administering painless and profound local anesthesia. Learn how to do that. Watch the video in the library of dentistrymasterclasses.com on how to administer painless and profound local anesthesia. If you can't do that, you're behind in the dental game. Patients hate painful local anesthesia, and even worse than that, they hate feeling it if you're doing endodontics, extracting a tooth, something of consequence, and there's no reason for people to ever feel anything. You can provide painless and profound local anesthesia. So watch that video. So the first thing we're doing is um, this is a solid model. Always use a solid model when you're fabricating crowns, inlays, or veneers, and that lets you perfect the interproximal contact. I rarely have to adjust an interproximal contact, and if I do, it's very light adjustment with maybe a rubber wheel. So what's that video? But you can't perfect interproximal contacts on a die model. Those models move microscopically, and the interproximal contacts will not be right. Now, if you want total frustration and not enjoying dentistry, seat multiple crowns or veneers in which the interproximal contacts are off. They're too tight, and you've got to figure out which one. Now, I've got a video in the library of dentistrymasterclasses.com on how to do that if you're seating adjacent crowns and one of the interproximal contacts is too tight, it's sometimes difficult to figure out which one it is. And if you're not careful, you'll end up opening a contact by adjusting too much in an area that didn't need adjusting. So watch that video. But the best way is just get it right from the beginning. So this is the die model, and this is the solid model. That's the solid model. So I'm removing, I'm removing the provisional restorations by cutting between the veneer provisionals with this little mosquito diamond. Cut all the way through, then place a two by two in the mouth and just torque the provisional restorations, the provisional veneers. Now remember they're seated with adhesive only, no primer and no etching. And then the crowns on the first on the bicuspid and the molar teeth are seated with Olympia provisional crown and bridge cement. So they'll just torque off. Always put a two by two in the mouth. That's why I use a rubber dam on almost everything. I don't want anything falling in the patient's mouth and the patient swallowing it or aspirating it. And we're, tor we're just, Olympia cement's got just about the perfect strength. You can, they're strong enough to stay on the teeth keep the provisionals on the teeth, but you can remove them when you torque them. Then after I've removed the provisional restorations, I'm going to pumice the teeth with a rubber wheel and pumice in water. Don't use peroxide if you're going to be using composite cements because it can affect composite. Don't worry if you have a little bleeding. I'm going to rinse all that off. Then I'm going to wipe the teeth with isopropyl alcohol on a cotton ball. This just gets to places that the pumice on the rubber wheel couldn't get to. And I'm going to give them a good scrub to get any little bits of cement, adhesive, plaque, whatever, 
off the teeth and I'm going to rinse them again. Now the second time I'm rinsing them with cold water in a water bottle. I don't want to put a lot of pressure on that gingival tissue because the patient hadn't been able to floss their teeth while they're in the provisionals and the gum tissue is going to have a tendency to bleed. So I'm going to rinse it with a water bottle in cold water, not worrying if I have some bleeding because we know if you've watched my other videos how to control that bleeding. 38% phosphoric acid for 45 seconds. So now I'm going to try the veneers and the crowns on the teeth. And I like to dip them in water just to give them a little more grip. That water, the osmotic pressure or something, holds them on the teeth better than if they're dry. You shouldn't have to adjust the interproximal contacts just right. Then I'm going to seat the crowns and you can use this carrier which is red rope wax on a cotton tip applicator to seat the crowns and I'll even use that to seat the veneers when I do the final seating. You can refer to that link in the library. So all the contacts are just right. Then these are lithium desilicate or Emax veneers and crowns. Can lithium desilicate Emax break? Yes. Any tooth colored restoration can break, even zirconium. Trust me, I know. How do I know that? <laughs> I've had it happen. And the, the uh, dentist on the teaching faculty, faculty of my teaching center in Dallas, when we had that, said the same thing. Lithium to silicate crowns or veneers can break. Now they're harder than felspathic porcelain, but the only thing that can't break is a gold crown. So that's why many times I'll place at least gold occlusals on second molar teeth. You can't break it. Now some people don't want any gold showing in their mouth, even though you can't see it on second molars. And in those cases, we'll place a lithium to silicate or Emax crown on a second molar. But the patient needs to know it's not indestructible. I often say the only thing in life I know that's indestructible is a flint rock and a shot put. You can't break a flint rock or a shot put. Okay, so these uh, veneers and crowns have been uh, treated with the system you use to treat lithium to silicate Emax restorations, and you can refer to that link showing you how to do that. And then once I've tried them on the teeth, I'm going to wipe the tooth side of the veneer and crown with isopropyl alcohol. Then I'm going to use this carrier and place Vaseline on the interproximal contacts. That just keeps the cement from stick setting up and sticking interproximally. It's much easier to remove the cement. So just place that Vaseline on the interproximal contacts of both the crowns and the veneers. Doing the same thing here. These Emax veneers have been treated and now we've wiped them with isopropyl alcohol dry that off with your air syringe and then place Vaseline on the interproximal contacts and I'm going to use this carrier on the veneers and the crowns because it makes it much easier to carry them to the mouth. Here they're all ready to go. Then I'm going to etch the teeth to be veneered with 38% phosphoric acid. Now by accident I discovered this is a fabulous hemostatic agent. If you need to control gingival bleeding, place the 38% phosphoric acid on the gingival bleeding area for 45 seconds. If there's a lot of gingival bleeding, sometimes you may have to do it twice for 45 seconds. Dentist asked me, does that affect the enamel? No, it doesn't. Now, if it was dentin, you don't want to put 38% phosphoric acid on the dentin for more than about 15 20 seconds, but I've never had any issues with it whatsoever. So I'm going to etch half the teeth at a time, three or four, and then you rinse this off with a plastic water bottle with a pretty big hole with ice cold water. We get that water out of our water dispenser and it's cold. Don't use your air water syringe because there's too much pressure and you'll generate bleeding again. Then I'm going to etch the other teeth and see it'll cause any areas that are bleeding to scab like this. It's fantastic. One dentist commented that his dental school professor said, no, that 38% phosphoric acid doesn't work. And I said, hell's bells, try it. Just try it. Get some and squirt it on some, <laughs> some gingiva that's bleeding and see if it doesn't stop it. It's better than anything I've ever found. In cold water, then we're going to place 
primer adhesive on the two side of the veneers and blow it off. It's very important you blow off the primer adhesive. The reason you blow it off, there's an acetone carrier in the primer, primer adhesives that carries the primer into the dentinal tubules and it's attracted to moisture. That's why I don't, even though all the preps are normally in enamel, I still don't desiccate the teeth. I just blot them dry with a two by two because if there's a little moisture in the enamel, I feel like it'll pull the primer down into that those uh, enamel areas. So blow it off. The enamel is just mechanical retention. The dentin, if there's any of a prep in dentin, you're depending on the hybrid layer forming in the dentinal tubules when the primer is pulled down into the tubules by the acetone being attracted by the moisture. So we want to blow everything off and that gets rid of the acetone carrier. And I do all now before I do this, before I place the primer adhesive on the restorations and on the teeth, I want to turn off the lights in the operatory. The only light that I have on is the overhead light and I turn it down toward the patient's teeth so there's just a light glow on the patient's face just so I can see what I'm doing. But you don't have your headlight on and you don't have light on the patient's, direct light on the patient's teeth or that ambient light will cause the primer adhesive to set up and I don't want to do that. I don't want to bring out a curing light. This is my technique that I've used for 20 years. I don't want to bring, more than 20 years, since the 80s, I don't want to bring out a curing light until everything is on the tooth the primer adhesive, the veneer with the filled resin. So I don't cure it until I cure everything at the same time. And I don't cure it completely initially. I'm gonna show you how to do that in just a minute. So I'm blowing this off and then I'm gonna rinse the teeth and just blot them dry. That doesn't, I like a little bit of moisture on the teeth. Then I'm gonna place a copious amount of primer adhesive on the teeth. Remember the lights in the operatory are off. Only the overhead light turned toward the teeth is on. Then place a two by two around the teeth and blow all this movable primer adhesive off the teeth. Then I'm going to place the filled resin in the veneers. This is Rely X veneer. I've never used anything but that since the 80s. It's wonderful. You don't want a thick cement. You don't want a real viscous cement or it won't seat. You want a veneer cement. There was a time some people were advocating using a highly filled resin like Herculite to seat veneers. Well that, that doesn't work. It doesn't seem like it would work and it doesn't work. I grew up ranching in West Texas. If something doesn't seem like it works, it probably doesn't work. So it's got to make sense to me that veneer won't seat completely because the, the looting composite is too dense. So use a thin, a, a low viscosity uh, filled resin and this Rely-X is fantastic. So this is B0.5. Because of our preparation technique, you've got a definitive seat. If people are only prepping the facial surface of the teeth and the veneer goes only on the facial surface, it will swim and there's not a definitive seat and you won't seat it precisely. Because we're including the interproximal surfaces and the incisal edge, these have a definitive seat. On the first video, I go over wrapping and I've got an, several other videos in the library of dentistrymasterclasses.com on the importance of wrapping. If you see the preps for the first time, you go, oh my gosh, those teeth are over prepped. No, they're not. The teeth are as strong as natural teeth after the preparation. It doesn't affect the strength of the teeth and the preps are still in enamel. So I seat these with the two cotton tip applicators and using my carrier, keep the tip in the looting composite. If you come in and out, you'll incorporate an air bubble and you'll have a gray spot on your veneer. How do I know that? I've had it happen. So you've got to keep the tip in the looting composite as you squirt it in the two side of the veneer. You always want to put them all on at one time. Don't put them on one at a time. 
if you put the veneers on one at a time and you cure it, then you've got to remove the excess looting composite before you seat the adjacent veneer. What's that going to cause? Gingival bleeding. Plus, if you put them all on at the same time, you know the interproximal contacts are right. If you put them on one at a time, that veneer might move microscopically and the next one won't seat and you will hate your life. You won't do veneers because it's too random. This way they seat precisely. The interproximal contacts are ideal and the veneer is seated perfectly on the tooth. They, they seat themselves. They guide you. Each The adjacent veneers guide you in the seating process. So put them all on at the same time. And you notice I've not picked up a curing light. We don't cure anything until everything is seated. And because you've got the interproximal, con you've prepped the interproximal contacts in the incisal edge, it just goes clink. It just, there's a perfect stop when you seat it. If I'm doing veneers on bicuspids or molar teeth, I'm not breaking the interproximal contact on those. But I put a lug on the occlusal facial surface so I have a stop when I'm seating my veneer. Then I'm going to go back and just check them all. Be sure everything is seated completely. Now I'm seating the crowns on the bicuspid and the molar. I'm seating them before I cure anything because again when you seat them all at the same time they direct the seating of each restoration. There's no question the interproximal contact is correct. Plus, you don't have to worry about getting some cement on the adjacent tooth and then that restoration not seating. Just this, I've tried it all ways, and this is the way to do it. Then I'm going to have my assistant put her finger on the, on the crowns, and I'm going to pop floss between them before the cement sets. And I'm going to just pop that between each of these veneers. I'm not removing the excess looting composite. I'm just popping that cement between the veneers just to get the cement out of the interproximal contact. Then I'm going to go back and push them to place again. See, I've got all the time in the world because these don't cure until I hit them with the curing light. I'm being sure everything is on. When you pop floss between them, they may move just a tiny little bit, so you want to push everything back to place. And then I want to check the palatal to be sure everything is seated. Now this is a very important part. Once I check the palatal and be sure everything's seated by removing some of that looting composite, I'm going to press the veneers to place again and that's going to shoot a little bit more of the, of the filled resin out the palatal. So all the spaces between the veneer and the uh, tooth are filled. That micro gap is filled with looting composite. That's very important. And that's why you don't remove the excess looting composite until you cure it initially. You want to scrape it off and not wipe it off. But if you wipe it off, you're going to have some pullback or suck back out of that micro gap and you're going to have a void in that tiny little micro gap between the tooth and the restoration. All, there's a micro gap between all restorations and teeth. It may be 25 to 50 microns or it could be 100 or more microns. Well, bacteria is 8 microns. So that's like the Grand Canyon to a bacteria. And if it gets in that, that unfilled micro gap, you're going to have sensitivity, stain, and possibly decay. So you want to scrape it off so that micro gap, veneer, and tooth are like a sandwich. That micro gap is completely filled with the looting composite. So this is how you accomplish that. You, once you've got everything where you want it seated perfectly, you take your curing light and go 1,001 on the facial that quick, just 1,001. It doesn't take but a touch to set this up initially. And then you go to the palatal and do the same thing, 1,001. And see how hard that cement is with just that initial set. It's kind of like crunchy snow. Take the back edge of your scaler and just peel this off. Now when it peels off like this, the micro gap is filled. If you'd wiped it off, there would have been some suck back. That's a critical part of having the gingival tissue around seated veneers look like natural tissue. If you wipe it off, you're going to have bacteria in that micro gap and you're going to have irritated gingival tissue. 
So if you cured this more than a second, that looting, that excess looting composite is going to be too hard, and you're going to have to polish it off with a 12 or 30 fluted carbide burr. Then you pos pop floss between your crowns, and then when you pop it between the veneers, you pull it to the lingual. Now, I haven't cured them completely yet, just that pop, just to spot cure them. Don't pull it this way though or you might pull your veneer off because it's not set completely so I want the contacts cleaned and then go back and clean it a little bit more then I'm going to cure each veneer I use two curing lights I don't use the 12 second cure I use just a conventional Dimitron curing light that beeps every 20 seconds so I use two curing lights and I cure each veneer 60 seconds on each side that's overcure. You don't have to cure them that much, but you can't overcure composite. You can undercure it. So I want to be sure that composite is completely set. So I place one curing light on the palatal and one on the facial and cure them for 60 seconds for each veneer. Then this is a large flame shaped fine diamond and I use that to remove the excess looting cement. Just polish that off. Then this is a 12 fluted carbide burr and I use that very gently in the sulcus with lots of water to remove any excess looting composite in the sulcus. Now there was a time years ago when people said don't touch the margins of the veneer. Well that's kind of ridiculous because the technician is touching them when he's fabricating the veneer. So I do this because you get little bits of excess looting composite at the margin off and you know the margins are perfectly smooth. If you'll use this uh, 12 fluted, I use a 12 fluted because it's smaller than a 30 fluted carbide burr and use it primarily in the polishing direction, not in the cutting direction. You know when you're using a handpiece in one direction the handpiece polishes. It's that direction. If you use it in this direction, it digs in and cuts. So you primarily want to be using it in the polishing direction. Just a light touch and lots of water. Get all that excess looting composite off the margins. Same thing on the palatal. It's a light touch. You know, that's why Veneers are at least as, as expensive as a crown. With a crown, you prep the tooth, place the provisional, and the seating of the crown is not that big a deal. You just take the provisional crown off, clean the tooth, and put the final crown on, then adjust the occlusion. With veneers, the seating process is almost as time-consuming as the preparation, impression, and provisionalization process. Now this is the flat end of an amalgam carver. That's great for removing any looting composite or adhesive off of the facial surface of the restorations. It doesn't etch or doesn't make a dark line on the veneers and it cleans that off very nicely. Floss them again once they're set completely. You can put a knot in that floss and move it back and forth to be sure you get any excess cement out from between the teeth Then check the occlusion. This is a, an articulating paper I've used for 40 years just because I, I like it because it marks wet. Final occlusal adjustment. Then I like to finish with a Shofu rubber wheel and I want the Shofu wheel to be either polishing this way or from the veneer to the tooth on the palatal surface and that just puts an ultra fine polish. I like to drip, have my assistant drip a little water while I'm using the wheel and just it puts an ultra fine polish on the restoration. I do the same thing when I'm placing class one direct composites. I always go back with that Shofu wheel and polish the occlusal surface of the tooth to be sure there's not any little bit of, of adhesive or uh, filled resin irritate the patient's tongue. Then I'll sit the patient up and look at them from the facial to be sure the incisal edges are just exactly right. There's normally a little bit of adjustment and so I always do that though with the patient sitting up looking straight at me to be sure the incisal edges of the anterior teeth are parallel to the pupillary line, a line drawn between the pupil, 
pupils, which is parallel to the floor, and they're rising. Then after I've done that adjusting, I'll come back and polish that with that Shofu wheel. And here's the before and after. We've lengthened the teeth just a little tiny bit. That's the dental minute. These techniques work, and they work every time. I know you want to take your practice to the top tier. Subscribe to DentistryMasterclasses.com for an organized library of all the Dental Minute videos, plus many complete comprehensive cases and many very important articles that you cannot get anywhere else. New cases are added weekly, only $20 a month. Subscribe now.